Hello, YouTube. Okay, so I'm sorry I'm getting this one out pretty late, but I've been very backed up with school. Like, I've been having a unit test every day this week, so not really my fault. So, yeah, there are a lot of things I've been doing at school, and it's just, it's just a mess. But now I'm finally getting a chance to actually talk about this, so yeah, let's talk about the two new episodes, Star vs. The Forces of Evil. So, the first one is about Marco, who is trying to get some movie tickets for a marathon of all these movies for kung fu and stuff, like these big kung fu movies for an actor who killed himself by performing a stunt on himself. How on earth does that happen? Like, did he snap his neck by mistake? What happened? <laughs> But, um, yeah, apparently he died performing a stunt on himself because that is physically impossible. So, yeah, Marco really wants to see this movie marathon, but they're all sold out because movie marathons for, like, 30 movies are always held in movie theaters. Just the way things are normally done. But... Turns out that Tom comes in, and he has the movie tickets. Um, was he preparing for this? But yeah, he has these tickets, and he wants to take Marco to it. How out of character. So yeah, him and Marco go to this movie marathon, but... Yeah, we never actually see them actually go to the movie marathon. Instead, we see them going there. It's like them actually just in the car. Yeah. But at least it's a very cool car. So, that's something. It has a white tiger! So, that makes it really cool. Alright, but then they eventually get in a street race with people, and the people get arrested by the cops for driving too fast. I wish more movies would go like that. Seriously, that's the realistic fashion of it. I love that joke. But, yeah, eventually it is revealed, though, that Marco and Todd like the same music. What an amazing revelation. Oh, and also Todd... I'm um, sorry, Tom. Sorry. But, yeah, apparently Tom also has been just playing Marco this whole time because of his anger management thing. It was a requirement. And this eventually prompts Marco to want to leave. So now it's up to Tom to get him back. And I don't really know why he tries to do this. He just, I don't know, wants to make things better or something. I don't know. Sure didn't care about that when he tried to kill him a few times. But now that he... Got him angry. That's a good motivation. Yeah, me trying to kill you a few times, me getting you angry. Hmm, which one should I make up for? The angry thing, that's it. So, yeah, they try and make things up by singing a song and it doesn't work. Surprising. But eventually Tom decides he's that maybe some necromancy can help. It does! Because truly, resurrecting things from the dead, that's what saves a friendship. Remember, people, if you're ever about ready to lose a friend, resurrect their favorite movie star from the dead. It'll work. Even if the, even if the actor or actress is not dead, do it anyway. It'll work wonderfully for you. So... Yeah, they resurrected Mac Mackie Hand, I think that was his name, and they go to the movie marathon, but eh, Tom tore up the tickets, so Mackie Hand fights off security, and that's good enough for Marco. For some reason. I guess seeing it in person is kind of cool, but there are like 30 movies going on back in there. You don't want to, you know, go through the doors and see that, no? Just, like, your seats are still there. Just because you tore up the ticket doesn't mean that your seats aren't available. There's still two empty seats in this place. 
And Mackie Hand can float, because he's dead. I'm guessing that you guys can find a seat. But, yeah, they just sit there, and we learn that they still don't like each other, making me really question why Tom resurrected a person for someone he doesn't like. Is is his anger management thing still going on? Or did he just want to see Mackie Hand in real life? So, yeah... And this episode was actually alright. Um, there are a lot of moments where it kind of feels slow, and the fact that and the whole entire Tom Mal character thing can get kind of confusing. Like, why would he bring back someone for a guy he doesn't like? That makes no sense. And this is after th he already lost the anger management thing, so... Um... Yeah, why sh Why is he still trying to do this? Do you just think, well, this guy likes the same type of music that I like. I better try and make him a friend because I don't like him. So, yeah, that out character bits are kind of odd. But outside of that, it is actually a pretty good episode. Um, I like seeing Marco actually trying to make friends with them, and actually seeing them hang out was really cool. Um, I honestly wouldn't mind seeing that more often, because Marco needs more friends that are supernatural, I guess. That aren't, aren't Kelly, so, yeah. You might have another friend named Tom. But, yeah, I don't know. I don't really know where this is going. It could go somewhere. I don't know, maybe they'll become friends. Who knows? It's possible. So, yeah, this honestly could be leading up to something. I don't know. Probably not. But it was at least a pretty funny episode, and there are some good moments in it. So, yeah, this one was okay. Um, After this one, we got the names episode that I forgot. But, yeah, pretty much the one starts off with Buff Frog. Walking around the cornfield, taking notes. Truly the most fascinating way to start off an episode. So yeah, he's taking notes about what happened and everything. Like, he's still surveying, trying to find out how they can make this breach in the force field a little bit bigger. They never thought of just, you know, bringing the tadpoles into the force field and stealing the corn that way. Because that would just make sense. But... I guess they don't have hands yet. Maybe that's the problem. So, yeah. Clearly, this will never work because they don't have hands. So they just gotta find a way to make this force field, which is impenetrable up until this point, bigger. This little hole bigger. In the unbreakable force field up to this point. This will work wonderfully. So, yeah. He's still trying to find some information on that when... He gets knocked out by meat, by meat fork, I think his name was, or meat hook, but, yeah, he gets knocked out by him, and now he is stuck spinning a wheel to grind up corn, send it to the boss, and eventually he decides, well, I'm just gonna break myself free, in a very, very pointless interlude of him trying to get the keys, which results in nothing, so then he just sticks his tongue in the lock and picks himself out. Why didn't you just do that first? But, yeah, apparently that was unfeasible up until he took the keys and accidentally ate them. So, yeah, completely unfeasible up until that point. So, and then he just sort of walks around and sees if he can find anything, but eventually he bumps into Meat Hook again, or Meat Fork, I don't know. He has a fork thing, so I'm just gonna call him Meat Fork. So, yeah, he bumps into him again, and Meat Fork asks to take him with him. Okay, so, yeah, they're starting to leave, but, yeah, they're still gonna check in on what the boss is, so... But Frog goes and finds out that it's Ludo, who has pretty much lost his mind. Glad that that's been confirmed. 
So, yeah. Him and Ludo fight for a little bit, and Ludo offers him a job because beating him up is the best employment reason. Like, you can beat me up. You're the best employee I'll ever get. So, yeah, they... So, yeah, Buffrog thinks about this for, like, a few seconds, and then just decides not to, and he punches Ludo in the face. And for some odd reason, the spider and the bird are still loyal to Ludo. That's weird, I thought they hated him, and they were just doing what he said, because, well, they don't have a choice, but... Even though Ludo's been knocked out now, and it's not like he's even asleep on them or anything, so they can get away here. The bird has a family it needs to care for, but they decide to stay and even get Ludo's wand back and even try to bring Buffrog down again. Why? But yeah, eventually Buffrog and Meat Fork get away, they say their farewell, and... Buffrog makes the decision that he needs to warn Star that Ludo's after the book. And that's it. So, yeah, for this episode, it's alright. Not as good as the last one, but it's alright. There are quite a few things revealed in it, which is nice to see some more reveals about Ludo being alive, being found out. But... Yeah, it's not really that great. There are a lot of really boring moments in this one, but some of the jokes are are worth it. Like Meat Hook can be funny, or Meat Fork, whatever. Yeah, he can be pretty funny at times. Yeah, there are some other times where he can just overstay his welcome with a joke, and they'll just end up really failing. But there are others that he does actually end up funny. Like, we find out where his name came from. It's a family name. An amazing revelation. I was kind of thinking it was from the fork on his hand, but it's a family name, apparently. So, I guess everyone in his family cuts off their hand and replaces it with a meat fork. So, yeah, they... That's a revelation, I guess. So, yeah, for this one, it's alright. Like I said, there are quite a few good things revealed in it, but overall, it wasn't really that great. It was actually pretty boring. But at least the reveals are pretty good, so there's that. And some of the jokes can be pretty funny, so it is worth watching. It's just, eh, it's not the most exciting. So then after that one, we have Hungry Larry. And this one is honestly pretty good. So, pretty much it starts off with Mr. Diaz. I forgot his name. I think that I think that Mrs. Diaz said it was um, Jefferson or Robinson. I, I don't know. But yeah, Mr. Diaz has a haunted house, and none of the kids are scared by it. So he goes off into the shed to feel disappointed on life, I guess. And Marco pretty much tries to bribe some kids to go and act scared. Because, yeah, Marco's paying these kids, but they're still not going to act scared. Most realistic thing ever. But Marco makes it very apparent that Star and Jamie... Jamie... Jammy, I think. Jamma. 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 I remembered her name this time. The girl who maybe has a crush on Marco is named Gemma. Found that out. That mystery has now been solved. Okay. So, yeah. Her name is Gemma. I'm glad that I came to that realization after, what, four episodes with her now? So, yeah. She's... She's there for a little bit in this episode. I don't know why, but in the episode where she barely does anything, that's the one that I remember her in. That's the one that I remember her name from. So yeah, Star and Gemma go upstairs and go summon Hungry Larry because Marco specifically said not to. 
Amazingly, this blows up in their face. Because Hungry Larry, Big Shock, is hungry. <gasps> so, yeah. He eats Gemma. And apparently, all the kids hear the scream and decide this must be the best house to go into this Halloween night. So they all come flooding the door and no teenagers come in. Because it's a haunted house. What teenager would want to go to that? But, yeah, no teenagers come in for some reason. But, yeah, that's fine, because there are a lot of little kids running around. Also, these kids are like eight, but they are up to this point on their legs, like up to their knee. How are these eight-year-olds that small? I really want to know. How are they that small? Like, maybe they're five or something, I can understand it more, but... One of the eight-year-olds comes back, and yeah, he's really freaking small. How are they this small at the age of eight? But, yeah, they're apparently very small, but they're all eaten. So, of course, Star and Marco go into the room, and this scene is actually really creepy and does build up suspense, so I will give this scene that, that it's really good at saying an atmosphere. And, yeah, Star and Marco are eaten. Um, is anyone gonna beat Hungry Larry? And apparently Mrs. Diaz is eaten off screen. Cause why would we want to see that? So, yeah, Mark, Mr. Diaz eventually decides that he's going to destroy his inflatable Frankenstein for some reason. But this doesn't work. Prompting him to go outside, seeing the candy corn that Mrs. Diaz left for him, walk inside, over to the piano, start playing the piano for a little bit, then have some of that saliva from inside of Star's room go onto his finger, thus prompting him to go into their room. It took way too long to explain, but yeah, I could just said that he just goes back inside and goes into the room, but I wanted to explain this in detail for no reason. So, yeah, he goes into their room, and Hungry Larry introduces himself, because, eh, he's full, so why even try to eat him? So, yeah, he pretty much just tells Mr. Diaz to leave, but Mr. Diaz won't take it, and starts fighting Hungry Larry, up to the point where Hungry Larry's even scared of him, and then he... Beat some. Woo. Shocker. So, yeah, he gets his family back, and Hungry Larry drives off in his taxi. Which apparently was waiting outside for him all along, and knows exactly where to take him without him telling him where to go. Of course. So... That was Hungry Larry's, that was the episode of Hungry Larry, and this one's actually really good, especially for a Halloween episode. Um, last year's Halloween episode, I didn't really like as much. I mean, like, it was okay, but, yeah, I feel like it could have embraced the spirit of Halloween more. This one definitely did. Just, like, all around this episode, it just feels like Halloween. Everything in it. To the haunted house, even even if it is a lame haunted house, heck, that's half of the haunted house is on Halloween, so it feels so genuine with the holiday. There's so many good costumes everywhere, even stars just as Ludo, and even the ghost summoning and everything. It just all feels like Halloween, especially when he, when Hungry Larry comes in. When he comes in is when this episode gets really good. Up until then, it was eh, kind of boring, actually. Like, there were some funny moments, but yeah, that was it. But when he comes in, it actually gets really creepy. This show actually did a good job at building up some form of fear and trying to be suspenseful. And there are not even any jump scares in it. Thank you. So that means that this show is better than doing horror movies than most horror movies nowadays. Wow. That, that's sad, actually. But, 
yeah, it honestly did really set up an atmosphere for this one, so I really did like this one, especially since I've been getting more and more into horror movies now. This honestly just felt so welcome to me. So this was honestly a really good episode with some actually creepy imagery in it, so yeah, I really love this one. So then after this one, we have Spider with a Top Hat, and it's about a spider with a top hat. Drop your jaw in amazement. So, yeah, a spider with a top hat. So, yeah, this episode pretty much starts off inside of the wand, which it will be for the remainder of the episode until, like, the very end. And honestly, that's actually really cool. I like seeing the inside of the wand and how it's pretty much just like an apartment complex. It's really neat, and it's just so cool. It, it's just all treated like all the spells are actually alive. Except for some of the spells that stars use. Like the pancake one. There are no animate pancakes around. I'm disappointed. But, yeah, pretty much... It does incorporate a lot of the overuse spells in it, so yeah, I did really like that. So, for this one, Star is pretty much calling on spells all the time, but I don't know why I brought her up. I'm so used to talking about the main characters on the show, I guess. But this one is about a spider with a top hat who is an entertainment spell that has never been used on the show ever. But apparently, still lives inside the wand. For some reason. So, yeah, Spider with a Top Hat. It's an entertainment spell, and everyone pretty much loves him. He's a nice little guy, but every night he goes in and tries to do his best in becoming a fighting spell. But to no avail. Eventually, this does end up taking its toll on him, which becomes a bit apparent over time. But... Yeah, people don't really care because he's funny, I guess. Perfect reason. So, yeah, eventually this leads to him finally being able to crack the wall. Good for him. So, yeah, he's able to crack a wall up to the point where he needs a magnifying glass, but he's able to crack it. So, with that revelation, he goes over to his maybe best friend, not really sure, they don't really specifically say, I'm just gonna guess that this is his best friend, but he goes over to see his best friend, Narwhal, and he immediately shoots down his idea of becoming a fighting spell. Best friend ever! So... Now, with this sad, sad truth, he pretty much gives up on life the next day. That got dark, but eventually Star starts calling all sorts of spells because she's apparently in some form of danger. We don't know what, but she's in some form of danger. So then she eventually actually calls on Spire with a top hat. Don't know why, that's a pretty random spell to call on, but she called on it, so... He finally gets his chance to prove himself, and turns out his top hat's also a machine gun. Awesome. Also, all the bullet shells are little tiny machine, or tiny little top hats. I love that. So, yeah, this is honestly what I came to the show for. Absurd, yet awesome things like this, and this was awesome. So, yeah, he... Defeats this giant wolf outside of their house. What on earth was going on before you called on him? Like, what was happening? I want to know. But, like, is there going to be an episode about what they were actually doing before they called on Spire with a Top Hat? Because I really want to know. But, yeah. It apparently involved a giant wolf. Why did I miss this? So, eventually, Spire with the Top Hat has now saved the day, and he's now Star's most powerful spell. 
and is even called upon by Star again. And I guess he never woke up any of the other spells ever again. So that was this episode, and honestly, it's pretty fun. Um, for one, Spire with the Top Hat, I do like his character. He's honestly very likable. Um, he's not especially funny, though. Like, there's nothing really about him, even when he's trying to be funny, that I actually found funny. Like, even before we see him hit himself against the wall every night, which definitely took away the humor. Um, yeah, even before that, I never really found him funny, but apparently all the other spells did, so I guess I'm the idiot. So... Yeah, I honestly did like him. He's a very likable character to be able to follow through this. And honestly, even though the story has been done a lot, like with the character trying to prove themselves and everything, I do like it. I do like the way that was done. Um, we also get to see inside of the wand, which is awesome. I honestly really like that. Um, it's pretty much just like a giant job, and it's awesome. Like, I never really thought about what would be going on inside the spell, I just sort of, like, inside the wand, like, I sort of thought that, you know, they just create the spell and that's it, but, honestly, I do like how they did here, it was really cool, so, yeah, it was honestly really awesome just to see inside of the wand, I thought that was just so cool, um, so, yeah, honestly, this one was really good, I thought, like, it was just so creative with everything that was going on inside the wand and outside, also, it gets kind of war scene like when they go outside this outside of the wand because there's fire everywhere. People are crying out. One of them's even saying that they can't see. And there's even a beanbag that gets killed. I know. Sad. A beanbag dies, people. A beanbag. But. Yeah, we lost the beanbag. So yeah, that moment honestly got really dark, but it was kind of hilariously dark. So, honestly, this episode was actually pretty good. Um, most of these episodes for, like, most of these past few episodes have been pretty good. Although, probably the weakest one is the one with Buff Frog. Like, things going on in that one never really were that interesting, but... It was honestly still some pretty good episodes, so yeah. I still want to see where the show is going. I'm glad I'm glad that I didn't give up on the show. Like there was some time during season two, like in the beginning of it, where I was really considering just giving up on the show. Just like it was going nowhere. It just got so slow. I was almost falling asleep during it. I got so bored. And well, yeah, it still just kind of had that feel. It kind of always did, so I guess it doesn't really matter. But, yeah, it's definitely improved a lot. Like, I don't know what changed. Maybe they were hearing, like, people saying, okay, this is getting really boring. Try and work on this some more. I don't know. But, yeah, it has actually very much improved. So, yeah, I'm honestly very curious to see where it's going to go. And, honestly, these were some pretty good episodes. So... Yeah, that's pretty much it. Bye.